uh, but presented by uh, Andy Self. He is uh, filling in for Cody, who is in officer training uh, school, uh, learning to fly helicopters. So uh, he, uh, the Army wanted him to be there instead of here. I'm not sure. He just couldn't quite work it out. Uh, so uh, Andrew, he's, um, he's a, well, I don't have your affiliation other than with Mississippi State University and Farm and Forestry. But uh, come on up. Uh, I like to walk around a lot, so if you get to where you can't hear me, just raise your hand and I'll walk back over. Uh, like Dr. Guevara said, this is actually some of uh, Cody Rainer's work, some of his graduate work there at MSU, and uh, this is just a small portion of his overall project. Dr. Ezell thought, well, since this is a... Uh, a symposium basically bringing all the different hardwood techniques that we know into play that since injection is recommended in so many instances we might want to talk something uh, specifically focused basically into that particular practice so keep in mind uh, you're going to see some pictures that have other things going on in there like shelter wood cuts and stuff like that but all we're going to really get into on this particular presentation is uh, his injection work uh, like all good grad students, Cody has a chain of people that uh, help him out there and get credit. So you can read through the list and recognize a few names. Uh, one, of, one of the big issues that you've heard over and over and over again in the past day uh, that I'm going to kind of reiterate here a little bit is about life, getting regeneration back on the ground. A lot of the stands we have out there, uh, we've got really good overstory oak component, but we're not getting anything uh, that we consider desirable as uh, you know, commercial timber production back on the ground. Uh, Cody found a little over 6% available life uh, across his six areas. We'll talk about that a little bit here in a second. But uh, that's pretty typical. Everybody in here has been in stands that look just like this. One of the limiting factors uh, on, this, on all of his sites for what you see right up there, that mid-story uh, level there just limits the light so much even when you get into this type of scenario where that overstory has been removed the those shade tolerant species that are already established down there on the ground actually just explode they take over uh, there's not a lot of a uh, lot of chance for the any oaks to get established before you get that flush of growth that uh, limits you know limits the uh, you know, advanced reach in that you do have in the few cases that he did have it uh, it limits you know, the ability of that particular uh, oak component down there to actually get up and get established. Well, progress, I guess. Um, just a slide showing kind of kind of what we're dealing with here. Now, all stands aren't like that, I understand that. And then there, there are some instances where you do want that mid-story component. But this, this is what Cody was dealing with. Uh, we'll get into exact numbers here in a little bit, but a very, very, very dense uh, mid-story component to all sets of Stand. For the purposes of this talk, all we're going to talk about, he wanted to get an effective uh, mid-story controller through injection, and the purpose of that was to get that light down on the ground that uh, he needed to get oak established. <laughs> Six study areas, 20 acres each, 15 acres of uh, injection, and uh, five acre total control with no injection and no uh, mid uh, sorry, no overstory work either. Came to about 90 acres total, a little over 72,000 stems that we had to actually go out and inject uh, one at a time. And that gives you about 800 stems per acre. Now right there, my understanding is at the last Central uh, Hardwood Conference, Cody got deemed on that a little bit, and he didn't really know how to answer. Is that uh, you know, past the flash point, so to speak, for arsenal? No. Uh, that comes out to a little bit less than, I'm sorry, a little bit more than uh, five ounces per acre of arsenal. It's a lot of injection work, but keep in mind, you're putting a very, very, very small amount of arsenal out with each, uh, each hack, so to speak. So no, he would not pass, uh, pass the recommended rate. Three sites all clustered around Starkville. Uh, he kind of had a, an interesting array of uh, properties there. We got into uh, John Starr, which is you know, state-owned grounds, university-owned. 
what I still refer to as Knox V National Wildlife Refuge, Sam D. Hamilton Refuge, uh, which is of course uh, federal, and then Barge Timberlands, which is a private entity south of uh, the refuge out there. So you got to work with, you know, the, the broad spectrum of landowners out there. Kind of, kind of unusual. Across uh, the, the the six study areas, we. I don't want to say we hedged anything because we didn't. The purpose was to get Oak Ridge in on the ground. So we're better to do that in something than somewhere with a really heavy oak component. You look, you know, that may be a little higher than you typically would expect to see an overstory, but about 68% of the overstory was comprised of uh, oak species. Average age of 83 uh, across the six areas. Basal areas range from 92 to 122 and average elevation about 240 feet, uh, side indices. Uh, and I'll be honest, I'm not exactly sure how he determined those. Did he do Baker Broadfoot or did he? He did Baker Broadfoot. Broad uh, chemically side indices, uh, average about over 95 feet uh, for red oaks. And pHs range from 4.5 to 5.2. All good oak sites, all had a heavy oak pollen take on. Not a all-encompassing list of the things that we injected out there. Uh, this is a pretty good sampling. Uh, these are the species that you know, made up the predominant mix across the areas. Exactly what you expect to see in this type of setting. Uh, just, just an idea of what he had out there. One thing you don't see on that list are oaks. Uh, for two reasons. There weren't a lot of them, and any that were there, we didn't inject. That was the purpose. We were trying to get, trying to get those oaks established. Keep that in mind. Injection took place August of 2009. Uh, simple hack and squirt method that everybody's familiar with. Uh, everything greater than one inch DBH, that was what we deemed an undesirable species, was injected. Uh, of course, using the uh, you know the 20% solution uh, arsenal, real simple technique. Hack it, squirt it in the, the slit, and walk on. He came back in August of 2010, this is basically one year after treatment, and uh, took 90 one fortieth acre plots in, a, in an attempt to uh, you know, set up some kind of an index of how well that injection worked, what the efficacy was behind it. Uh, basically everything was recorded as was it injected or was it not injected, and then a 100% uh, you know, scale of what, what we, you know, I'm the guy that did it. Uh, what we actually assign efficacy-wise, you know, control for that individual stem. I mean, was it untouched, basically from the chemical, or did it die? Anything <coughs> we recorded that on both mid-story stems that we injected, and we also looked at the overstory stems uh, in the stands to see if there was any kind of negative impact uh, to, to anything out there other than uh, our target uh, that we injected. Results, uh, you, some of you may recognize that picture yesterday uh, from Dr. Ezel's uh, presentation yesterday. Uh, this is pretty typical for what areas look like uh, in, in the really heavily in injected areas. Right here, there's over 100, I'm sorry, over 800 uh, stems per acre. Uh, you'll notice again, not a lot of region in there on the ground. What's there is gonna be elm, hickory, maple, things like that. There's not a lot of oak established. I have no idea why I did that. Okay. Uh, that's what we got. Now this, keep in mind, this is not looking at any of the mid-story, I'm sorry, the overstory manipulations that he did. What you see here is strictly a result of that mid-story injection. That being said, this is probably in the edge of a hole. If you look at the size of, of that opening right there, I think this photo is probably right on the edge of a kind of a, a canopy hole. So you may have a little more light here than, than you really expect to see uh, through just this type of treatment, but he did get about an 11 point bump in uh, available light hitting the ground. That, that's pretty significant. And another thing to notice is you see right back there, the only difference between the injection and that is that's a control. That, that's the type of light that you see getting to the floor uh, in these non-injected areas prior to uh, any of the overstory removal that I was talking about. Numbers, uh, basically, if they were injected, we saw about a 97% reduction in the crown. 
uh, if they weren't injected, less than 1%. So not a lot of transference into uh, non-injected and not a lot of natural uh, mortality and crown reduction uh, without the injection <coughs> technique. That's, that's exactly what you expect. If you break that down into a site setting uh, and think of it as well, you know, maybe there was an outlier, maybe something pushed it up. Now, the lowest uh, control that we found out there was a little less than 94, I'm sorry, 95% uh, on one of his sites. Great control. They did exactly what you'd expect it to and proven time and time again, Cody just put some more numbers to it. Uh, if you look back at the individual species, kind of, kind of an important thing here uh, to mention, there were some other species obviously that were injected, but its sample size was too low to really get into mentioning them. Uh, the other thing is, if you'll look, you know, we're talking about less than three inches here, uh, or three inches and less, I guess. There were bigger trees injected. Again, sample size was so low that it really wasn't worth putting up there and say, yeah, we can kill you know, one six inch tree. And we did, but they're just not represented uh, on that particular table. Uh, another thing to notice, if you get down in here, with some of the species, they're even, uh, you know, they have some of that built-in resistance or uh, non-susceptibility to the arsenal products like the elms. Uh, we still did a pretty good job. We got about 92% crown reduction on a, a decent number. Uh, we had about 214 stems that fell in the plots that uh, we, we did get did get very, very good uh, control of. Year two, uh, which we didn't have numbers for, just walking back through the sites and uh, you know, kind of kind of looking when we we're doing other uh, other things out there, did get even further crown reduction. Basically, we deemed them up really bad the first year, uh, <laughs> killed 94, I'm sorry, 96% of them basically. The other 4%, definitely uh, were hurting. They, they had some other stem to drop out. Uh, don't have numbers for it right here, but it's kind of a cumulative effect. They did, they did drop on out in year two. Overstoring, uh, we found three stems that had some kind of phytotoxicity, some kind of herbicidal symptomology that uh, set with them. Uh, that's one of the things that you'll find in the literature out there and you hear a lot of questions about when you're doing injection work is, you know, what about that root transfer? Uh, injected this and several other places, I personally have never seen it. Uh, don't think Dr. Ezell's seen it either. It's out there in some of the literature. My personal belief is, uh, which we found in this particular case, is you have somebody that's sloppy with that injection. Uh, they, they, get, they get happy on the trigger. They shoot butterflies and snakes and everything else with the herbicide. <laughs> We have one guy out here that we kept saying no, come back, start here, quit squirting, you know, the, the pawpaw leaves, get it in the, you know, get it in the trunk. I honestly believe that's where those three trees uh, were impacted. Uh, they're in the area that we know he went through. Over 90 acres, three stems that came back in year two. Not, not really a big concern. Uh, basically, to sum it up, real simple. 97% effective across the uh, six areas. Very, very little non-target impact, we just talked about that. And uh, no permanent damage to any of the residuals. We think the mass appears safe to use out there. Again, you, know, you hear concerns with it, we really didn't see it, uh, and we haven't seen anything else. Definitely effective and relatively cheap speed, in, uh, cheap so to speak, and uh, it's effective on a lot of species, even, even those that you don't think of taking out with a foliar spray. In this case, we, we did a pretty good job on uh, through the injection. Uh, gets in the system a little more easily. And if you are careful, you shouldn't have any problems. Like I said, that's real simple, and I feel I've got a lot of time to talk. So. <laughs> Ask questions. Great. What component of the mentor there was green ash in there, uh, not a lot, and I can't give you exact numbers. Uh, Cody could do a better job of that, but there were there were patches. Is that like a decision there on what it happened? I can't give you an exact number. And then also we've injected hundreds of acres, and uh, we've never seen any flashback either. Or you're doing these uh, mid-story treatments. What's your over your canopy overstory? 
your canopy cover in those areas? Oh, this, this was practically speaking 100%. There were a few holes here and there from you know, blowover, basically, but uh, pretty much 100% overstored, pretty much 100% mid story. Uh, very little light. Dr. Hyde? What was the light intensity after you after the injection? How much light did you get out of it? 16.5%. Is that right? You went after, uh, went after about 17-18% okay. after the injection only, as like Brady said, it went up about 11 12 which is not adequate for uh, the open regeneration of the street to part of the park. But it's a start. And if yeah. you don't do it, in this particular case, you know, you know what you're running into. I mean, did you have reason to think that you were going to have a good acorn crop that year? And, and has that been followed up with, were you successful in the regeneration of oak or establishment? That's several questions. Yes, <laughs> it was, it was uh, right here. This is two years, <coughs> this is two years post, uh, post treatment. This is in the 50 BA shelter uh, wood. You got oak, oak, oak. <coughs> we started uh, putting flags on them and then decided there's so much oak there we didn't really want to do. Yes, it was successful. Uh, no, I don't believe it was scheduled with an acorn crop. However, it's kind of like ground <coughs> walking through it. We did, we did have a good, good crop, at least on the, the swamp chestnut. Great. If I could add one thing to that, we talked yesterday about the importance of timing this with the you know, good acre crop. And we had a good acre crop for some of the species that were only signed, but not all. It was a great situation where we take it down to a 20 plus inch nut all over. Nut all over didn't have a really good crop that year. Ground is covered with a nice advanced regeneration now of water seedless <coughs> because of the water nearby. Water did have a good crop that year. So, you can't have all species all year, but we did have a good crop. We got we had great, well, we have hundreds of seedlings per acre now. Uh, uh, we would say past one foot during the advanced stage. Oh, yeah. I thought it was marked timber in one of the pictures. Was that the yeah. result of package work only or coupled with harvesting? I'm sorry, say that anymore. Was, that, was there harvesting done too? There was. There was. Okay. Uh, this, like I said, this is in the, the 50 basal area, 50 square foot of basal area uh, shelter. With this particular okay. photo, uh, that's what the, the marking was, the, the tape tree. <coughs> speaker is Tom Matney. He's a professor in the Department of uh, Forestry at Mississippi State University. And he's going to talk about the comparison of anticipated yields, volume, and species composition of bottomland hardwood stands at various densities under management systems favoring shade tolerant versus shade intolerant species. I don't think that would fit the uh, you know, wildlife journal. We have this 10 word yeah. maximum well, of titles. I don't think that would fit that. <laughs> Well, we changed the title anyhow. Oh, so, you did? Yeah. Jury uh, alert. Based on our... <laughs> based on our... <laughs> okay, you ready? Oh, wait, let's, let's control Okay. Okay, I'm here kind of to give you a broad overview of the available growth and yield models that are out there in the universe. Uh, growth and yield models are the desired method, really, of determining expected yields under managed stands and unmanaged stands conditions. Uh, you can use fragmented studies that are often done, but they just give you mostly what you can relatively expect they really don't give you good expected yields under the various management conditions. So you need a really good growth yield model. So 
like any good researcher, as Emily and I started to prepare this presentation, we did a literature search. And uh, our original objective was to give you some good information on yields and that sort of stuff. But as we looked at the literature, we saw right away that there's really not that much stuff out there. So it's very difficult for us to get it. Uh, so what I'm going to start with is available, reliable growth and yield models. And you'll see that all the available, reliable growth and yield models we have are for mostly intolerant commercial species that we have. And the reason for this is, in the past, growth and yield models have been driven by the Forest Service, but mostly by the big companies. So the concentration has been on pine. Uh, some years ago, uh, John Hodges and uh, N.C. Burkhardt and myself, to some extent, started a hardwood growth and yield project for the valuable cherry bark oak stands in the state of Mississippi or minor stream models. Well, what it boils down to is most models are pine models. Uh, we have some short leaf, but really for the other forest types, we have virtually no data. I mean, we are in the dark about the growth and yield of these species. Okay, so they're just, they're just not available. And that, that's very disappointing given the, some of the cost and time and all the talk that we've done about these kinds of things. Uh, and I decided what we do is take a little directional change. And I give you some broad idea of why there are no growth new models. Because it takes a lot of money to develop a good growth new model. There has to be sufficient commercial or other interest in a forest type to even begin to talk about developing a growth yield model because they're so expensive. Uh, it takes uh, a lot of talent in math, science, whatever, to do a growth yield model. And uh, qualified biometricians are a dying breed, so there's not many of us left. Unmanaged stand models. Most of the models out there are for unmanaged stands. Because it is really difficult and costly to do a managed stand or a mule model, the number of plots typically required to do your basic growth mule model is minimal, 200. And just a few years ago, that was $1,000 a pot plus to develop in this country. <coughs> Uh, remeasured numbers of times, five or six hundred dollars per remeasurement. Uh, so the money required to do this adds up, and 200 plots is not adequate to do a managed stand growth in your model. You need four or five hundred plots really to do a good job. Uh, and of course, uh, your development time. I mean, we're not talking overnight, we're talking for your basic fast growth species 15 to 20 years. Uh, and for the more tolerant, slow growing species and hardwood species, we're talking 20 plus years. We're just now publishing the hardwood growth yield model that John Hodges and uh, I and E.C. Barkhart and some other people started in 1982. We just now got a solid data set. It's taken that long. And the primary reason we have, you have basic uncertainties and funding, all kinds of things that go on. Uh, so it takes at least two years of analysis and computer programming for result delivery. Okay. Uh, managed models require uh, feasible uh, management treatments uh, to a subset of plots. Uh, and it has to be a lot of them because you're going to have to evaluate a lot of different management scenarios. So the number of plots required just becomes overwhelming pretty quickly. Uh, 
You have to have a post post mortem analysis. How good is your model? You know, I've been in the model building for a long time, and I can guarantee you that after you've done all that work and you come to the end of things and you do your course post mortem analysis, you'll find the patient is dead. If the model doesn't work, and you have to go back and redo it, you know, and and you might you you might have to redo this model a lot of times. So it takes time to do these things. Uh, and any model, it has to be biologically consistent, and that's a very difficult thing for this kind of day. Uh, and a uh, verified model responds to known interactions. If your model does not respond to maybe some interaction between trees per acre and basal area correctly, you don't get the right answer. So you have these problems with the models. Uh, rebuild and test of the model behaves according to expectation. It can take months of reanalysis and equation refit. So uh, this is not an easy task. And any growth and yield model that's worth its salt has to have a computer interface. It has to interact with the end user. If it doesn't interact with the end user, it's worthless. You know, because you just don't go to a publication and extract a growth and yield model and start using it. Some program has to be provided to make it usable. Uh, and you can see that we have a lot of stuff here. Graphical display of volumes, complete financial effect, yields by grade, for strict, projected structure and yields for managed and non-managed options. So a growth yield model has to do a lot of things. I'm going to bad mouth inventory data. Inventory data is a snapshot of the unknown. You don't have any age, site, cannot predict future yields and that sort of thing. So if uh, the uh, U.S. Forest Service Vegetation Simulator is a good source for a lot of species, you get the growth and yield, but it's short on data for your tolerant species. There's just not much data for tolerant species. What's the solution? Invest in long-term studies. Uh, and, but, you know, low value, Marketability of long rotation ages will hit the long term investment. It's hard to get investors. It really truly is hard to get investors. We try for them. Um, essential yield and economic factors, and this is in our the growth and yield models that we build. We provide managed GY cumulative stumpage and volume and dollar yields, establishment costs, management operations. Taxes, inflation, harvest costs, road costs, percentage of area and roads and skid trails, and other periodic revenue and cost and hunting. So these are the things that we incorporate into the growth yield models. And the results that come out sometimes are good. You can get uh, most of the MSU GY model installers at www.timmergroove.com for those of you who are interested in it. Okay, these little slides here, I'm uh, gonna run through them really quickly because they just illustrate what an interface would look like. This is uh, the cooperative inter interface that we have between Mississippi State, the Forest and Wildlife Research Center, and the U.S. Forest Service here at Stoneville to develop a hardwood model. Uh, it's still under development. We have mostly graphical interface for this particular model showing you the expected yields, that sort of stuff. Uh, we have bar charts and graphs, but we also provide yields in the tables to traditional model. And you get the predicted volumes. In this case, I think it's board feet up there. I can't see. I think it's dual board feet. It's 25,000. Uh, for the various species, the red oaks, the sweet gums, the hickories, and that sort of stuff. So this is a very graphical interface of how structural changes occur. Uh, we also provide tabular interface showing, in this particular case, 
This model shows expected yields by log grain. So this is something new to us. We've never done this before. Uh, we're learning how to do it now. Uh, predicted volumes. Uh, you can see how the stand changes in structure. This is cubic foot. Uh, the top curve is your red oaks, and the little green curve is your sweet gum, and you can see that the sweet gum hangs in there. You get a picture of how the stand is changing over time. Uh, same thing here, but it's in board feet, you know. Here's a typical pine model that we developed. has a graphical interface. Uh, shows your standard stock tables and your volumes. This particular model does everything. It's weight, chip, carbon, you name it. It outputs it. Whatever you want to know. It uh, gives you merchantable volumes. Uh, and it also has the ability to give your stand, you know, your thin volumes, how much volume you cut and that kind of thing, as well as the growth rates after thinning, whatever. Uh, it gives you your harvest standard stock table at this time. Uh, we did age 35. And it also does a full economic analysis and cash flow analysis for you based on your inputs. So it's a pretty sophisticated interface, and it requires a lot of input from the user. A lot of numbers have to come from the user because the financial conditions in the world constantly change. Uh, so, and at the bottom, it gives you, uh, at harvest, whatever the internal rate of return is, all kinds of stuff that you really didn't want to know, perhaps. Now, let's talk a little bit about comparative growth rates here. This is about all I can piece together from the literature, showing you uh, your expected yields, and except for a few species like cottonwood and yellow poplar, your yields are pretty much the same for most of these, uh, expected yields are pretty much the same for most of the intolerant type species. Uh, so, you, you know, the upland oak would be a little bit less, but you're, you're looking at 4,000 cubic feet per acre. Uh, typical yields in those things. Here's the funny thing. I couldn't find anything for the taller species. You know, we searched hard, and we just couldn't find. You could find some stuff on diameter growth rates and that sort of stuff, which is the next slide. And you can see as we go down, you know, beach there, uh, one inch of diameter grows in 10 years on the average in a lot of places. So uh, these uh, tolerant species tend to grow very slowly. And as a result of that slow growth, if you're going to do a growth yield model of a tolerant species, it's going to take you many, many, many years uh, to do that because to capture that growth over that long rotation, is really tough. Uh, so the modeler is going to have to live a long time. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, okay. Now this is the only controversial slide I may have. And these are just some opinions that I have gathered from the literature and from my colleagues and I put them together on a piece of paper. And I'm just saying that uh, uh, some of the management things, such as small openings, will eventually uh, end in a fragmented forest dominated by tolerant species. I'm not arguing that it's good or bad. I'm just saying that's probably what's going to happen. Significantly longer rotation ages and probably lower log grade number of great trees lower commercial value, uh, high residual tree logging damage because the forest is fragmented and you need a lot of, you know, uh, places to turn equipment unless you, uh, greater oper operational cost, uh, reduced forest areas, roads, skid trails, and logging decks. So 
you, you need a lot more of that kind of thing when you have a fragmented structure. So I can find the right button here. Uh, returning to a more tolerant species mix will be costly and difficult because it'll have to be you know, replanted and all kinds of things like that probably. Uh, except for the commercially valuable species, and that's pine and all those uh, real commercial values the companies are interested in, we don't have a lot of knowledge to make informed decisions at the moment. Even for species with G or Y models, these models are still based on too, late, too little data to be totally reliable. We never have enough data. It's impossible. Uh, mounting long-term studies and growth and yield is almost impossible because of the timing and uncertainty of the funding. So those are some obstacles that you have to look at in some kind of consideration, and that's it. <coughs> Any questions? Yeah. When you're next to the last slide there, your model related to the desired forest conditions, what data sets do you use to derive that information? Just discussions with uh, people, uh, colleagues, and that sort of stuff. I'm not driving any kind of conclusion. I'm just saying that based on a general thing, they, they, uh, most people have concluded that that would be the case. But in the extreme, I'm not saying, you know, I mean, uh, but in the extreme, small, very, very small openings, so that's probably what's going to happen. I just have to comment that I think that's all. As the figure yet to be said, that's an erroneous model. And I don't think you speak for the majority of the people. Well, I don't know whether I speak to the majority of the people or not. Uh, there's probably a lot of disagreement in this room about that point. You know, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't have any personal uh, knowledge of this. I'm just saying what we have discussed amongst ourselves at uh, the college and other places. So, uh, you can disagree if you want. That's up to you. I just express an opinion. And it's, I mean, opinions are fine. I don't see the scientific data to support that. Well, opinion. we don't have any scientific data. <clears throat> the problem is with everything that is being stated in this room is that we do not have sufficient information to make a lot of statements. <coughs> you know, everybody's proposing everything. But I don't see the information there. The scientific information is not there. So everybody in this room has an opinion. Yeah. Well, I think there is plenty of scientific information <coughs> that shows if you do single tree selection management in forests that have a predominant oak component in the overstory, that the succession is away from oaks to the shade intolerant or shade tolerance speed. Well, I would personally agree with you. you know. And then, just from what I saw in one of the economics talks yesterday, if you look at the stomach value of <coughs> red oak versus the tolerant species, at least in today's market, you know, if the, the economic value of the sand is going to decline if you push it towards the shade tolerant species. And well, there's, there's plenty of literature out there that shows that kind of a testimony. Well, our personal data sets would indicate that that's true. What you're saying is true. Okay. Now, that hasn't been published or anything like that, and I'm sure that other people have data sets supporting your conclusion. Okay. And the other side probably has uh, plenty of data that they believe supports their conclusion. You know. I think the erroneous assumption is that the single tree selection, and I would agree with everything that's being said, but nobody is proposing the single tree selection, so that's, that's the rub, I guess. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, your, your, uh, uh, these small group cuttings are about the same thing as single tree selection in a lot of respects. I mean, you're just leaving a small open. And you know, it, it, uh, most of the evidence that we have in our data sets would indicate 
that that's coming back in tolerant species. Yeah. When we then selectively the 50 square foot of basal area, I fail to see a significant difference when and the easel tends to 50 square foot of basal area. <coughs> we've got open, got pictures, we've got data. Doesn't work everywhere, doesn't work every time, but none of it does. But we fail to see a difference between thinning the 50 square foot of basal area to get over regeneration, thinning the 50 square foot of basal area, and chemically treating the mid story to get over regeneration. Well, I'm not a silver I'm just a broken mule guy. <laughs> 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 Tom Thomas uh, was here speaking about modeling and, and what we're doing now is getting into the topic of, of our panel discussion. So why don't we hold off this, th this is what we need in the panel discussion, but really Tom's a modeler, so. <laughs> no, the, the content of this talk is on modeling, so let's, let's, let's before we broaden into the larger topic, let's, let's let Tom on, because it's time for our next presentation. Okay, our uh, next presenter is, is Dan uh, Twig with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service talking about avian response to silvicultural treatment prescribed in the <coughs> wildlife habitat and bottom and hardwood forests. silvicultural treatments that were implemented. All these are on Tensaw River National Wildlife Refuge, and they were implemented before the concept of DFCs was actually undertaken, but they were implemented to enhance wildlife habitat on that property. And really, we're talking about moving stands that are fairly dense, have a lot of uh, closed canopy stands and trying to move them into more open canopy, more heterogeneous forests. And the way we propose or the way they implemented that is through uh, mechanical or timber harvest. And there is no magic bullet or necessarily a prescription for getting to what a specific wildlife requirement is. But in general, if we look at the majority of our bottomland hardwood forests up the Mississippi Valley, what we really are looking for is to move those closed canopy dense forests with not much understory to something that has a more reduced canopy, a more herbaceous, lush understory, and a lot more heterogeneity within the stands, but still retain emergent trees, cavity and den trees, as well as some dying and senescent trees. And at least to my perspective, we still want to retain some vines and a cane present for certain species of birds and other wildlife. We've had a lot of discussion earlier about what the different management techniques can be used for regeneration and for forest management. And there's argument on which one goes in which category, etc. But by and large, if we look at things that are typically referred to as even age, at some point in that management cycle, pretty much the entire canopy is going to be removed. And if you remove the entire overstory, that bird community is going to change. You in order to have a forest bird community, you need a forest, and once that forest canopy is gone, most of those forest species have to move to other areas of the, 
again, in the landscape, that forest remains, but they have to move. So pretty much all those techniques that remove the entirety of the overstory are going to change that bird community. And they're not going to result in what we think of as desired forest conditions. And similarly, the single tree selection is just not going to create enough diversity in that overstory canopy to create the kind of conditions we want for priority bird species. What we generally, well, at least I have generally referred to, as other people probably haven't, is a variable retention and cluster thinning where there are, cap, there are gaps created in that system and there's a general thinning throughout the entire stand that's being managed, but at the same time there are adjacent stands that are not being managed or are being managed at a different time frame. Yeah, that's basically the same thing we just said. We're just trying to create that heterogeneity in the, land, in the stand, open up the canopies, produce better understory. What does that look like? Well, this is a one hectare plot of uh, uncut bottom line hardwoods. See where the, there's not a whole lot of holes in that. It's pretty well covered. And once that treatment is undertaken, you end up with a lot more light on the ground and understory vegetation in those spots. At the same time, we are still retaining several large diameter, large canopy trees. This is six years after a treatment. You see that the control had 94% canopy cover, but even after six years, it was already back up to 80% canopy cover. Got a lot more advanced regeneration, a lot more understory cover. The mean crown or the crown stem diameter is pretty much identical, but these that are remaining do have larger crowns. So getting into how this is affecting birds, is this actually good for birds? Is it bad for birds? Indifferent? Well, we looked at the untreated, the thin, and the un and thin with embedded uh, larger patch cuts. And actually, some of the slides that I saw yesterday of the various treatments, you could actually, in my mind, substitute these for our treatments, and you'd be hard for us to tell which treatment was one and which was the other if they didn't tell you. You basically are ending up with those holes and a lot of opening, a lot of light on the ground. <coughs> we looked at treatments from one to 13 years post-treatment, although the, most of those were less than six years. <coughs> the blue, these blue dots, this would be an untreated site. The blue dots will be where we took bird counts. We had six counts in each of the uh, treatments. The reds are little patches within the stand. So this area would be a treatment. These would be basically small patch cuts. And the rest of the area that was highlighted would have an overall thinning in it. Overall, we looked at 23 stands, six counts per stand. We made three visits to each point over two years. So how are birds affected on this? Well, many of the species, we found similar densities between the treatments and the untreated sites. Now, the, usually when we're doing a study, you think, well, there's no treatment, it's, it's ineffective. But in this case, we actually, no difference is good. We don't want to impact the forest birds that are out there. We want the birds that are breeding in the forest situation to remain in the forest. We don't want them to go someplace else. But that's not to say that their densities remain same. In fact, some of these birds occur at pretty high densities and some are pretty low densities. But the differences between the treatment are not there. So they're, they're staying in the system after the treatments are harvested. There's a couple more species that if we looked at overall densities, that we didn't find any treatment differences. But 
I'm not going to say that that's necessarily a neutral response because I'm going to bring up another point in a minute when we talk about the time or temporal aspect. So just bear a couple of these species in mind. Being Protonotary warbler and Flames' warbler, which are two fairly high priority birds in these systems. Now there are some birds that are negatively affected by the treatments, even as we implemented them. Now at least some of these first three on this list, in particular, Cadian flycatcher, Tufted Titmouse, and Carolina Wren, occur at pretty high densities pre-treatment. Even though they go down quite a bit, they're still at pretty high densities post-treatment. So even though we're losing a fair proportion of those birds, it's probably not a big deal because they're still pretty common in the system. Similarly with the red-eyed vireo at least, it's a, uh, although we're losing about half of those, it's still a pretty common bird throughout eastern North America. It's not a priority bird in terms of management concern. On the other hand, there is more positive response from uh, birds that are very rarely occur in these dense canopy forests which case they are coming up quite a bit. In some cases, they're coming, coming up substantially once treatments are undertaken. Some of these species that are increasing, we may not to, want to increase that much, that being the brown-headed cowbird. We do see a positive increase or a positive response to treatment. But again, they're fairly common in the controls, a little more common in the treated areas. But since they're in both systems, we're not, even though they're, we really don't want cowbirds in the system, but they're there whether we treat the system or not. What about temporal response? All I showed you so far was, do the treatment affect the positively or negatively? But we all know, and we talked about this yesterday, that these systems, as soon as you ch change the system, things change over time. They're not constant, they're not stagnant. So what happens over time? Well, this would be a classical response, I guess, to a, to a treatment in that on the next couple of graphs, this grid dashed line across the bottom is the uh, control. That's the mean uh, density of bird. In this case, number of detections. It's not density because I'm reporting this on a uh, first stand basis. But the number of detections in the control sites and then if we looked at years post-treatment from 1 to 13, that's as long as our uh, chronology went, we basically see that they have a positive response over time. At some point in history, in this case five to eight years, they pretty much maximize that positive response. And then they dip the quality of that stand diminishes for this species until it returns to pre-treatment levels. Now we, I did this as a prothonotary warbler I talked about earlier, where we didn't find any differences in the numbers between treated and untreated sites. But in fact, if we look at this, there is a negative response. So these guys are actually responding negatively to treatment over time, and it takes, it's almost the inverse of the one I just showed you before. And at least part of this, in my mind, I didn't point this out on when I was giving you the numbers between treatments, but there were less cavities and less snags on treated sites, possibly as a result of treatment, we don't really know. But these are cavity nesting birds, and they really seek out those small cavities and dying snags, and that may be why they're going down on these treated sites. Uh, start with the bottom couple here. Red-headed woodpecker has almost an immediate response to treatment and just continually declines over time. Kentucky warbler is almost another classical response, bell-shaped curve. These guys up on top are even more interesting in my mind in that they either have no initial response to treatment or possibly a negative response to treatment for the first four, five, six years. But at some point in time, maybe five years, maybe six years, those stand conditions then start to take on characteristics that are 
uh, appropriate for these two species, their numbers increased, and then we have uh, an increasing population of those on those treatments over time. But it doesn't take place in the short term, it's a long term response. How long is that response? Well, our chronology only went to 13 years, but if we model at least a couple of these species, well, back up. The initial response, the peak response for redhead woodpecker is age one, one year post treatment, and it only lasts for about eight years. So if you're managing for redheaded woodpeckers, or you want to maximize those, you'd want to go back and evaluate those sites at an eight to 10 year cycle to make sure you continually add habitat for that species. Similarly, some of these other species, maybe a 10 or 12 year uh, entry cycle or evaluation cycle to see what those conditions are. However, if you're looking to manage for white Iberia swings and warblers, extending those evaluation or entry cycles and delaying your management for 10, 12, 15, 20 years or more may be appropriate. Now again, these are starred because we don't have treatments that are have been evaluated that long, but our model says that Swainson's warbler doesn't really achieve maximum benefit until 16 years after treatment. What about, what about wintering birds? Uh, we have less data on wintering birds and in breeding birds, but if we look at, this is from uh, some banding data, oh no, excuse me, this is from uh, count data from transex. We find more species and more individuals counted on both the patch treatments and the thinning treatments compared to uncut. A couple of those that are more common in the uh, thinning treatments were red rusty blackbirds and red-headed woodpeckers, which are high priority birds. Constant effort mist netting we've also used. It pretty much just reinforces our data that we get from counts. We've, we've basically banned every 10 days in a number of sites over the course of the summer. Uh, captures go down regardless of the site we're in over time. But if we look at our treated sites, the numbers of captures is consistently higher on treated sites than on untreated sites. Winter captures, we have at least a couple of years data that show, whoop, Numbers of captures are higher on the patch cuts and the thin cuts compared to uncuts in at least a couple of years. But it seems that if there's a really high number of birds, that they're certainly going to be using these uncut sites as well. So in years where there's a uh, tremendous migration from the north for whatever reason, those woods are going to fill up. But if it appears at least, and this is somewhat anecdotal, but based on these data with those wintering birds, are preferential to using the treated sites over the untreated sites. Can I just ask a quick question here? On the uncut, why is there such a change over time? Uh, on the captures. On, on this graph right here? Yeah. Oh, this is, this is three different winters. So year one. So this so is basically. Really temporal variables. Right, because basically what we're capturing is most of these birds are wintering birds that come down from the north, so it's in response to migration. And it, what we're really assessing is what birds are in that system, and it's it's as much dependent, or if not more dependent, on the conditions, wintering conditions up north, and what drives birds down as much as what's in here. What I'm saying is that it appears from these data, if there's a lot of birds in the system, they're spread throughout. If they have a choice where there's fewer birds in the system, they're using the treated sites. Uh, this is captures for the breeding bird. You see the same type of response that we showed in our models, but this is just based on capture data. Some quickly, some 
of a slower response that degenerates over time. And again, the swings is the hood warbler, very little response for the first years, then it takes off. So in my basic recommendations, the severity of the treatment does have an impact on birds, and if you're removing more than 50% of the canopy, you're probably going to be losing some of those forest bird species that are in the system originally. And maybe that's, if that's your intent, that's fine, but just be aware that you're going to lose those forest birds and they're going to be replaced by scrub shrub type species. Uh, now, unlike almost everything we've heard today is that we want to, uh, we seem to be having a choice of are we going to manage these rather intensively for timber or are we going to manage them for wildlife? But for most wildlife agencies, that really isn't the question. The really question they're dealing with is, are we going to be able to manage our timber or are we not going to manage our timber? That's the real question. Because one of the things that we've implemented here or we've stressed is that we're saying we don't want to treat 30% of the area because the constant question we get is, what are you doing? What damage are you doing to that wildlife population by managing that? And we really have to be able to prove and show that our treatments are more beneficial to wildlife than no treatment. That's the question. So our, the treatment interval, for most species, a treatment interval or an evaluation interval, if you will, of 12 to 16 years is probably going to continue maximum benefit for those species. And but for some of those unique species, maybe a 20 or more year cycle would be more appropriate. <coughs> That's it. I had a question. Um, you had the uncut and the patch and the thin, so you had two treatments. Right, then, and the, the patch cut has both the thinning with the bedding. Right, so you basically had two treatments and an uncut, but then on a lot of the data you showed your density and, and some of the graphs, it was just by treatment. So were those averages of the two treatments? That they were because uh, basically we found little or no difference between the two treatments. Okay, well that, that's... I, and yeah. I have papers that do display that, but it just gets too yeah, busy. I, believe, <laughs> I, I was just curious as to, you know, you had by treatment. Yeah. I knew you had two treatments. I just wanted to know how you handled yeah. it. That's basically we found there wasn't any difference between the two treatments as far as birds, and we just lumped them. In the back. Oh, yeah. Dan, in, a, in terms of those stands and the numbers of years involved from 1 to 13, were you looking at each stand through all 13 years or did you have different stands that were sampled at different times during that period? We had different stands. There was multiple stands involved in the <coughs> For the uh, <clears throat> monitoring work, there was 23 stands. And some of them were mount monitored in two, maybe two or three years. Uh -huh. So there weren't they weren't all unique stands. There was some replication in, in years. Uh, for the banding work, I think we had somewhere between eight and 12 stands that are monitored over time. But they weren't monitored from year one through year 13. Some were monitored from year one to three, some from four to six, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, for a few years, right. and each of the window, okay. And while some of them was more like for 10 years. Okay. The other question I had, if I could ask one more, has to do with when you uh, apply the treatments, did you keep records of what was removed and the, the value of the removal and the cost to apply the treatments? No, I mean, I did not. These were, these were all implemented by the Fish and Wildlife Service as part of their management. And so I, I, let me say, I'm sure they have complete records of all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I just have a comment about, I think, a, a terminology discrepancy. In your last slide, you, you, you listed your patch cuts as being three acres in size. Okay. Above the three acres or something like that, right? Right, that's what they were. By definition, a three acre opening in a 
lot of my heart was saying to Stephen A. But yet, in your early part of your presentation, where you had even age and uneven age, you put a big X through all of the even age, saying that those were not appropriate for these birds. So I think there's a terminology uh, discrepancy that's leading to a lot of the disagreements. That I, I would agree completely. Okay. <laughs> and so I, I think, uh, and, and also I wanted to point out, you have thinning under uneven age, but not under even age, and thinning can be used in either system. Okay. So I, right, I, I guess I would point that out, and I think that's leading to a lot of the, the disagreements among the, the various groups in that. Um, you know, let's all talk to try to talk the same same language, to use the same terms, and, and so that we all understand exactly what we're talking about. So that's not it's not, it's not a question. No. Yeah. Uh, just some thoughts on when you put the big X on the even age. Um, suppose I had a debt time where that that's kind of a stand level perspective of trying to provide desired course conditions. And if you look at it from a landscape scale perspective with even age management and an, and an, un, an uneven age forest age structure, you still could provide somewhere on the landscape the desired forest condition. Uh, let, me, let me just wave that, that right now. I think that'll come up in our discussion, so I'm not going to get too involved, but I would strenuously argue that that is not. Yes. Are you or your colleagues working on, a, or, or do you have similar research for the, this model in terms of its impact on game species? I do not. We are implementing, we're about to em embark on a study looking at bat response to these treatments throughout the uh, Mississippi Valley, the lower Mississippi Valley, but in terms of game species, you know, my other colleagues refer to them on one quick slide, one quick question. Um, just trying to look at this from a common ground standpoint. In a future uh, element, speak up so everybody can hear. Okay, in a future element to a study, um, one thing you could look at, um, one of the options and still can here. <laughs> Stand up. All right. In a future uh, element to the study, um, one of the options in the shelter wood harvest that we do when we come down to base layer 50 is retention of overstore. And then, you know, one of the things we want to do also is remove midstory. But if we were to incorporate into that some retention of desirable midstory species, such as the ash that we talked about, or some oak stores, and just see what that condition would do with the bird population. And the, there has been a, there's been a great deal of work looking at legacy retention, if you will, you know, residual trees. And yeah, there's a great deal of literature that shows that that's beneficial. And it just depends on the degree. But yeah, those well, are certainly an option. Okay, Anthony? Is it 40 acre patch clear cut or patch opening is good? 40 acres is too big. Where's the transition from good to bad there? Reverse. Three acres is good, 40 is bad. Uh, where's, the, where's the transition, do you think? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that anybody knows. We've uh, we put forth, I think in the, in the document we produced, uh, I think in like seven, to seven, up to seven acres is what we, we said. And it, it's sort of like the previous speaker. We don't have any good data to support that. That's sort of our gut feeling. And that what we're really, basically we're trying to if you have a smaller opening, three acres, five acres, there's still a lot of forest around the edge. Those forest birds are still gonna be able to use that opening. They're gonna be able to go back and forth and extract resources from the opening, but they're still gonna have you know, protected habitat surrounding it. Whereas once you get 10, 20 acres, 50 acres, then all of a sudden that community can't utilize that space anymore. It's just, it just won't go out there. And there, are, there is some literature about how big the gap, the gap is that birds will cross, but I don't have that up on me.